Um, so we're going to push the envelope a little bit <laughs> in this session, um, which is typical for most of my sessions, if you've been to any of my... How many of you heard me speak before? Okay. Um, this whole concept of embracing a new paradigm um, should strike a familiar tone from many of you who've been doing records management or trying to do records management in the SharePoint platform. Show of hands. <laughs> Easy? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Someone who's already embraced a new paradigm. A um, little bit about me before we get started. Um, I have a, a consultancy that's focused primarily on information architecture. Um, this has been a migration, actually, for me from core SharePoint development to more um, content modeling, content analysis, and preparation for um, building SharePoint solutions, dealing with some of the pain points that we're going to talk about today. And out of those experiences, have, you know, I've, I've come to realize um, sort of the hard way uh, that the real focus needs to be shifted in order to achieve real-world solutions in the record management space. It's interesting that I got sort of pushed into the records management area. In fact, invited to speak at records management conferences, not SharePoint conferences, and even invited to speak at conferences where we're talking about legal um, concerns and risks uh, related to content management, simply because I happen to have written a book on records management in SharePoint at a time when you really couldn't do records <laughs> management in SharePoint very effectively. Um, so it's kind of an interesting progression of experiences that have led me to um, some of the conclusions that I've reached and some of the um, uh, information that I want to share with you uh, today. Um, because there's definitely a paradigm shift happening um, in terms of how we as developers think about dealing with the requirements that most of you, I'm guessing that most of you are either records managers, not developers, am I right? Records managers or people who are tasked with managing um, the flow of content in and out of records repositories, maybe even archiving um, information, right? Am I right or wrong? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, most of the people that I encounter are in that boat, right? They've been given SharePoint because for some reason someone's decided to buy it. Right? And so all the content is flowing into this new repository, but without any governance to speak of. Okay? And your background is either going to be coming from an archivist background, where you're tasked with putting these, content, these documents in the right place. You're also tasked with dealing with core risk management issues that you really don't have the tools in the SharePoint platform to, to implement those. Um, and so what do you do? You come to the IT guys. You come to the developer guys, and you say, look, I need... To, to, to implement these rules. I need to translate this retention schedule into something meaningful in SharePoint. How am I going to do that? Developers say, well, I don't, I don't really know what to do. Why? Because we don't really have the tools to deal with it. So um, what are we dealing with with records management? I thought it would take us through sort of the, not the history, but just sort of where we are in terms of what the SharePoint platform offers for dealing with these kinds of problems. Okay. And it's kind of interesting to take an overview. Now, this is admittedly old data, but I think the patterns are still the same, right? If you look at this, what, what, do, you, what do you get from this? Well, what I get from it is <coughs> SharePoint is still kind of in its, um, we're still ramping up in terms of people ad adopting the platform, right? So enterprises are bringing SharePoint in. Where is most of the, in of the effort going? It's going into infrastructure. It's going to, into setting up the platform. Right? It's going into deploying site collections and managing the flow of content in and out of the content database. Not a lot of attention, not a lot of money being spent on how we should structure that content. Right? So if you see, you know, if this thing works, let's see here. Up here, you know, governance is really lacking when we're dealing even with something as core as retention policies. Right? The retention policies are sort of out there in this nebulous world, but in SharePoint, Maybe some attention given to it, but it's actually not that easy to set it up, right? So not a lot of uh, dollars being spent, not a lot of uh, focus being spent. Interestingly, also, email, although email is, you know, that's where the content's coming from, right? Still not a lot of attention being given to how to govern 
where that email goes, how it gets filed, how it gets processed, how rules get associated with them. Um, a lot of attention, though, being given to basic things like team site administration and, and access rights to content, right? So what does that mean? It means that you're going to have unstructured content but in a well-structured environment, right? You're going to have nice packages for putting content, but within those packages, they're going to be at such a, you know, sort of a big bucket level, even if you talk in, talk in terms of, you know, retention even, it's going to be hard to distinguish and apply real rules to, to that content in a way that's going to make sense for most users. Um, ultimately, then, users are not going to like it very much, right? They're not going to use it very much. Um, another challenge that we have with SharePoint is that it's so comprehensive, right? It covers the full range of highly structured, highly un you know, unstructured content, high volume, low volume content, all of it is being stored in the same um, platform, right? So, you know, these things have different pro processes associated with them, right? They have different types of rules associated with them. We need much more flexibility than the SharePoint out-of-the-box platform gives us, right? So how do we layer on top of that um, a, a methodology even that will allow us to uh, deal with these challenges, right? So in my mind, you know, it's, it's, it's not so much records management anymore. It's really risk management, right? It's really, you know, the risk of keeping content too long, right? The risk associated with not keeping it long enough, right? The risks associated with not surfacing content when it's needed in the business process, right? If you put, you know, con you create a nice site for, um, not even for records managers, you create a nice site for project managers, right? And in a construction company, and you've got project managers that are only dealing with projects in Atlanta, Georgia, right? And you've got, you know, within that group, three different layers of, of access controls, right? Information's coming in from um, customers, information coming in from contractors, right? It's a very dynamic environment. And at any given time, depending on what people are doing, that content needs to be ready for them, right? They need to come to the site. You know, this paradigm shift I'm talking about, one of those shifts is we're focusing from static content to dynamic content that has to be ready when people need it, right? But they don't want to spend any time thinking about how it should be classified. They don't want to have to think any, any, anything about, you know, where did this content come from? I don't care. I need to get this job done. Let the system handle it, right? Put the rules somewhere else. Get them out of my face, basically, right? If you put the rule there, I'm not going to even use SharePoint. I'll just do it with email, okay? Right? Because I've got to get my work done. Right? So what's the risk associated with, you know, from, from a records management perspective, what's the risk associated with not surfacing content when it's needed and where it's needed? The risk is they're not going to use it. <laughs> right? And therefore, your compliance goes out the window. Your nicely baked rules, irrelevant. Okay? You've got to find some other way to enforce them. What other way do you have? Notepad. <laughs> right? Really. I mean, I'm, this, this is the reality. So. Um, what are some of the other risks? Well, assuming we can, we can come up with a plan that allows them to actually interact with the content the way they're comfortable interacting with them, there's a big risk of misclassifying content. If you give the users the responsibility to actually classify your content, and this is this old, old paradigm idea that you've got nice classifications and based on those classifications you've got cleanly defined rules and based on the rules being fired you've got nice filing mechanisms and it's all auto automated and you have to worry about it. Right? Well, assuming we can get that to work, first thing we got to do is classify content. Right? The risk is misclassification. Users are keenly aware of that. Right? You create a nice system, one that I've seen for email, Caligo, contributor. You probably have used it. You're aware of this product, right? Interesting idea, old paradigm idea, drag and drop email into the right bucket. Right? Structure it. Your job, or my job as a developer, create the right content types, set up the right repository in SharePoint, right? associate it with the right retention, surface it, surface it to Caligo so that it shows up as a bucket, right? rely on the user to drag it in there. Okay? All they have to do is drag it in there, fill out the form. Well, 
I get like 100 emails a day, right? And that's small compared to many people who are getting, you know, a couple hundred emails, they're processing these emails. You've added more tasks to them and you've increased their anxiety about putting it in the wrong bucket, right? They'll use it for two weeks. Then they stop dragging it over there, right? Or they just leave it, right? You can't make any assumptions about that. Unauthorized access, another obvious risk. Um, content management that requires too many steps, right? This is ex an example of one of them. Um, another vendor, Gimel, right? They have this concept of a drop zone, okay? For documents, not just emails. They also bundle with the Caligo product, for example, right? So what was the name again? Gimel, G-I-M-M-A-L, right? They, um, they're based in Houston. They have a, a system that allows you to um, do file planning in the SharePoint environment, and they're 5015 compliant, right? Uh, which is a big deal for U.S. companies, right? Um, they have this notion similar, old paradigm idea, drop zone. You drag content into this drop zone, and the drop zone is smart. It knows where to put it based on things that you've put in the content, right? Content type, whatever. Bottom line, if the users don't like it, they won't use it. I will even, I will even change this. Users won't use it, <laughs> right? They will not use it. Right? It's, it's, an, it's an amazing thing when you, you know, you're coming from a very you know, structured world and you get into the real world and the users tell you what the real reality is, okay? So what we need to do is we need to flip this paradigm somewhat, right? And not take such a top-down approach, but take a more bottom-up approach where we're actually empowering users to use our system. Even going so far as to say that we can engage users in the modeling process, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, I'm moving rapidly because this is a huge topic, right? Um, and I just want to get these concepts out. <clears throat> Going from an unmanaged to a managed state with content, right? These are some of the key ideas here, right? You know, pretty obvious. We've got some challenges. This is a longer list than this, but in the context of records management, you know, in an unmanaged world, meaning that we've just got content that's, say, on the file system where we don't really have many mechanisms available to do management. Um, interestingly, um, I had, I had an, a, a, an interesting conversation with a group in a U.S. government, in a fairly large U.S. government entity, where they actually implemented a fairly structured mechanism on top of just a raw file system, right? just putting rules on top of files, right? which, wasn't, which, which was so effective that they resisted the move to SharePoint because they didn't have those structures available. Right, where SharePoint is purporting to give you much more content control, they actually implemented a fairly rigid system <coughs> because it fit with the way that their users understood that content. Very, you know, regimented environment, right? So for certain environments, maybe file systems are good, but if you're still in an unmanaged state, right, you've got those basic challenges and you're just trying to have um, a managed scenario where you can get some control over what happens to your content key piece here is that you have to have a strategic plan. You have to have a mechanism by which you apply a consistent methodology to this process, right? How many have something like that? Same guy. <laughs> I want to talk to you after. <laughs> okay, so just some, you know, some interesting data points on strategic readiness as you're moving through this and as you're thinking about how you're going to structure that kind of methodology. I don't want to come across as saying that I have the answer, right? I, I just, you know, I, I want to share with you my perspective coming from my background and then confronting some of these issues. You've got to do a gap analysis, all right, obviously to see where you are and where you're going to, and that has to include an analysis of your technology platform. <clears throat> because that platform is going to dictate the constraints that are going to be imposed on your process, whatever it is, right? In this case, we're, we have multiple technology platforms to consider. SharePoint 2007, not so much anymore, but 2010 and 2013 are very different in terms of the style of platform, what the platform offers and what kind of constraints it's going to put on you, right? <clears throat> You've got to think about 
how content is used as much as how, how you're going to enforce your particular sort of records management controls, right? This is getting back to that, you know, letting the user drive this process to some degree. If you deviate too far from how users are using that content, it doesn't matter how perfectly structured your rules are, right? key area here, though, is to come up with some mechanism for doing both content analysis and content mapping. Content analysis, from this perspective, and you'll see more detail on this um, shortly, has to focus on how, how that content is being used. You have to map content to business processes in some way. Um, I've been touting this role activity modeling process that I've been using um, for s several years, it's very effective for several reasons that, that um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. Use case modeling is also useful because if you're dealing with technology groups that um, are already doing use case modeling for, you know, traditional solution development, it won't be unnatural for them to roll in some sort of content analysis to that, right? So it's just getting them closer to the actual business cases. The problem with use cases is that they're too general. Um, too broad, right? They don't cover the point cases very well. So you're making assumptions about content that may not hold for a given scenario. Um, an in-house skills analysis, I think, is an essential part of this because you can't not only make assumptions about um, how content is being used, but you can't make too many assumptions about how sophisticated your users are. You have to tune the tools that you give them to the actual skills that they have and maybe plan for giving them additional skills if you're going to give them additional um, responsibilities. All this sort of coming together in a broad um, ECM strategic plan. Okay, so this old paradigm that I've been talking about, uh, what are we working with? Meaning, what tools do we have? What does the technology platform give us for dealing with records management, right? Old paradigm <laughs> with SharePoint, these are the core ideas, right? Content types, okay? Content types, foundation of everything we're doing in SharePoint related to records management. Why? Content types are being used for every structure in, con in SharePoint, whether you're aware of it or not, right? Everything is based on a content type. So that's the natural place to put policies, right? That's the natural way to associate your information policy with lists. Even in a list, it's being done through a content type mapping on some level, right? So you can't get around the need for content types in a SharePoint solution, okay? Now that's not to say that, you know, that you have to structure your solution using the out-of-the-box mechanisms, okay? And we'll come back to that one, but content types are there. Record declaration is a primary focus for SharePoint as it, as it is today, right? The whole notion is that it's, a, it's basically a repository-based declaration mechanism. Right? What happens when you declare a record? Right? And I'm even talking about in-place record declaration. Right? Is uh, a real-world solution built on top of in-place records declaration will have to eventually move the document in order to apply any kind of location-based rule. Right? You can declare it in place to lock it down, but that doesn't satisfy most of your requirements. Right? I'm right, right? Yes? No? <laughs> right. Okay. So it's all based on a repository-based theory that when we declare the record, we're actually going to move it somewhere, and then in that location, we're going to put retention rules, we're going to put processing rules, right? Okay. So record declaration is a key concept, okay? Right? It, it assumes that we know what's a record. <laughs> it, not only that, it assumes that users know what records are. I don't know what a record is, <laughs> right? Why? It's context dependent. It's always context dependent, right? I'm sitting at my desk, the mailman comes, gives me a stack of, of, of mail, right? I'm sorting through it. I get junk mail, I know where to put it, right? I get something from my accountant, right? I have to open it to know what to do with it. Maybe it's a statement, but maybe it's something to do with my taxes, right? No, nope, then I know what to do with it, right? Okay, same stack of mail, you give it to my wife, <laughs> you get different piles, okay? It's all context dependent, you know, we, we, at some point we know that there's a record, something that we're important, 
But the context is as important as the content itself in order to determine if it's time to declare it or if we need to defer the declaration or if we need to hand it off to someone else. Okay? We can't make a general assumption about record declaration and reduce it to a button click on a ribbon. Okay? There's a process. So, old paradigm, content routing. Assuming we know how to get the record declared and we can enforce that effectively, then we have our rules. Our rules are associated with some location. Just because it's too hard to associate the rule directly with the content without some additional processing. Right? New paradigm, we can do that. Old paradigm, we can't. Right? New paradigm is search-based. New paradigm is metadata-driven. Right? Old paradigm is location-based. Old paradigm is rules fixed on a location. Right? Okay. No pushback? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, routing rules then become an important concept how we structure those rules. Unfortunately, because these assumptions are so strong, the routing rules are tied to the content type. Right? So I did an interesting um, test. Right? I went into a client and I said, OK, it was an old paradigm. Right? I went to a client, fairly large utility firm. Um, did some content analysis. We did the analysis driven by their existing retention schedule, because right? that was their pain point. They're a regulated utility. They have well-defined retention schedules that are given to them by the government. Right? How do we map these into SharePoint? John, you're the records management expert. Right? Just wrote a book on records management development. Right? You're the records management expert for SharePoint. Tell us how to map our rec retention schedule in. Right? So I'm looking at this retention schedule. I'm looking at OK, well, SharePoint gives us some tools to define retention. Those tools are assuming that we have a content type or at least a location that we can create an information policy in. Right? Now, how do I map these retention rules into that policy? So I went through the process, went through the exercise, gave them a report. Guess how many content types I ended up with? Someone, huh? More. 1,800, right? That was a relatively simple retention schedule, okay? 1,800 content types, right? Why? The rules were not normalized, right? Very hard to deduplicate the rules. I had to do a process of, of the, on the rules themselves to try to normalize them. The, the rule definitions were very fluid, right? right? This is a record unless it's superseded by some other thing and the supersession wasn't really well defined. And, I mean, you, you know the story, right? Very, you know, sort of back of the envelope type of rule definitions in a nicely structured spreadsheet, <laughs> okay? But doing that process, right, really opened my eyes to the constraint that the old paradigm really places on our ability to deal with real world requirements, okay? Um, just to take the old paradigm further, the other key piece here, it's a great innovation actually, when you compare SharePoint 2010 to SharePoint 2007, right? Fluid routing mechanism with the content organizer, right? So I'm sure we've all know about the content organizer, right? Who does not know about the content organizer? Okay, so basic idea is you have a list in SharePoint, and in that list it consists of rule definitions. That list is based on an internal content type called a content organizer rule where you can specify the content type for the incoming document, and you can associate rules, basically actions with field values that are also extracted from that content type. It's loosely modeled on the way that publishing works, right? Publishing works with a page layout and you have a content type that defines the fields, and then you build all kinds of processing on the delivery of web content just based on the field values, right? Works well in the SharePoint environment because it's all structured to manage those columns. So you have a column for um, the content type and you have a column for the rule expression and you have this built-in router that will receive content into in a drop-off library and it'll just on a timer job process those documents. When a rule fires it then executes the actions and typically the action is to file the document 
either in a folder in a record center site, right, or ship it off to another content organizer for additional processing or do some custom action on it. So it's a very effective mechanism assuming that you know what's coming in, right? You can predefine the rules, okay? Um, main points, it's metadata driven. So we're moving in the right direction. The paradigm is shifting to something that's more real world, functional, right? It automatically handles incoming records, so you don't have to write code in order to do that. You can just customize the rules directly in SharePoint. Nice out of the box technology, right? The target destination is determined entirely from the metadata, right? Um, and it supports hierarchical file plans, which means that you can target subfolders, which you couldn't do in SharePoint 2007, and it applies policies that are associated with that target location just using the way that SharePoint works, right? You can define a, a document library, you can put a policy on it that establishes the retention, anything that goes in there. doesn't matter what kind of document it is, PDF, right, images, whatever. It goes into, the con into that document library, the rule gets applied, and the retention mechanism automatically works. So, if you're looking at this from, you know, just old paradigm, you're looking at it from the way that SharePoint is designed to work, great idea, right? Okay? A lot cheaper to get that stuff to work. A lot of ways to use this, too. Um, I'm going to talk about pipelining, but I'll just mention it now. One thing about the content organizer that those of you who have used the content organizer, a, a unique way to use this is to you can deal with user adoption problems by chaining one content organizer to another one. Okay, Back to that Caligo example. One of the reasons that users don't like that so much is that it impacts their data, their daily flow. The larger that, di that dialogue is, the more items that they have to fill out, right? Every time they drag one over, the less likely they are to use that mechanism. Same problem for the drop zone. If you, if you drop a document in and it doesn't have the right metadata and it tells you you need to fill out this big form, right? You're less likely to want to do it if you've got other things to do, right? But if you could reduce the number of data elements to just a few, and tune those data elements to things you know, to the things that user knows, right? Meaning, map it to their business process, right? So that, you know, if I'm on the, the line in an assembly, in a, in a factory, and I've got a kiosk, right? And I get a, a notification from SharePoint that says you need to fill out this metadata, you need to reduce that to just the few things that I know about. If it's something that I don't know about, I'm not going to do it or I'm, I'm going to stress about it, right? So how do you do that in a SharePoint environment using the content organizer? Use more than one, right? Use a content organizer that just keys off of a few data points and sends it to another content organizer that then presumably is going to be seen by someone with more information in their head, usually, about how to process that. So typically these chains of content organizers are only a few levels deep, right? But it allows you to focus the requirement um, where it's likely to be um, acceptable. Okay, so advantages, gives you flexible control, no need for custom code. It does create a new rule manager user group, right? You have to be a member of that actual SharePoint security group in order to manage the rules. That's kind of a constraint, and this gets back to the skills analysis. How many people in your organization actually know how to build those rules, right? You've got to consider that. Disadvantage is that they have to be trained, right? They have to be um, kept up to date or the thing's not going to work. So <coughs> I put this up here for the benefit of those who are still sort of beginning this process to see what the old paradigm really looks like, right? Typically, when you're trying to structure a records management solution in SharePoint today, one of the first things you have to do is you have to decide how are you going to set up your site collections? Often that involves creating a site collection for every business function, every top level business function. Right? A site collection, right? meaning it's got permissions on it, it may have its own content database. Why? Because <coughs> you often need to partition the database. Right? You often need to partition the content. Right? It has different content, has different backup requirements, different content has different access requirements, right? Certain content may sit for a long time without ever being accessed. You could move that to cheaper storage. Other content may be very dynamic, right? <coughs> Depending on the business unit, right? So you structure your environment around the business functions that are there, 
right? Depending on how you've structured your categories, right? Okay. Step two, your record center. Nice in SharePoint, you can have more than one, but one thing you have to do is only, you know, put it at the root of, a new, of its own site collection. That's sort of a best practice, right? But you've got to decide how many of them you need, what the URL should be. You've got to work with IT, figure out where they're going to live. Um, you can also limit to one site per database. That's a, a, a heavier constraint, but that avoids problems with people who are untrained who might come in later and create subsites in your record center, which is not a good idea. Okay, routing gets broken, right? Things happen when you, when you deviate from the, the way that it should be structured, right? So you, that's an IT configuration thing, but you get a lot of benefits, right? Again, you can you know, easily take that particular record center offline, right? This is all not new to you, right? Who is this new for? Okay, good. I, I'm going to keep asking you because, you know, I have to figure out what, if I'm talking gibberish or not. Okay. All right. So, number three. This is where it gets tough, right? You've got to create and deploy your content types. Now, this is a pretty loaded statement for each type of content right, associated with each major business function. Right? This could take a long time, okay? And there's a lot of finesse involved in terms of figuring out what your content types should be for each type of content. I didn't want to use the word category here, right? I didn't want to use, you know, hierarchy, but um, business function, okay, these terms are so broad, right? It just really depends on, on, on your business. It's all context driven. Um, but basically, you're talking about a content mapping and content modeling exercise. Right? Without a methodology, you're kind of in the wild, wild west here. Right? This is where your risk begins to come in. Right? You remember that picture with the car? And the, right? This is where you're sitting under there, you're working on this stuff, but um, you've made some key wrong assumptions about how the content is going to be used, right? This takes so long, you deploy your solution, you expect people to use that, You've, you didn't know you'd made these wrong assumptions about the demands that are going to be made on the content that you've now created a dependency around. It has to be classified this way, otherwise your rules won't fire, right? Take something as simple as the content organizer. The way it works is, you have a drop-off library and the content organizer process sitting there watching, looking for certain values in certain fields. Right? That's your rule. It's going to fire when it finds that the right values are in those fields. Right? How do you ensure that those values are correct? You do some modeling to figure out what metadata you need to collect for each major category of content. Simple idea, very hard to do in practice. Why? those assumptions actually change. They're not static assumptions. You make an assumption today based on a thorough analysis today, it's like, it's like a waterfall model being applied to um, when, when you needed an agile mod model, right? You needed something that's going to be more dynamic and flexible because people change the way they work and the business processes adapt to demands that are being made on the business, right? So you can't make a static assumption that this is content that's always going to be that way unless you're in a highly regulated industry where they don't change that much or you're building your whole plan and strategy around retention schedules only. But that's old paradigm, right? These retention schedules don't map well into the new dynamic paradigm. Now I'm talking about paradigm, right? We're talking about social media. We're talking about search. Right? I had a friend just last night, I was talking about, you know, records management. And, you know, basically, this friend asked me, well, what do you do? <laughs> and I said, well, I help companies figure out how to structure their content. And she said, well, um, we just started using SharePoint at our company, but I don't really understand, you know, all of that. In fact, I don't use Twitter because it's too hard. And I said, what? well, wait a minute, Twitter's too hard? She said, yeah. I said, I, you know, I just Google. That's all I do. I just Google. 
right? Twitter, you know, hashtags, all that, you know, all that, I don't really want to do any of that. You know, it's a reality. <laughs> Users are being trained as technology shifts to resist structure, <laughs> right? They're being trained to embrace search, <laughs> okay? They want to find that information quickly and they want to act on it and that's all they want to do, right? That's the new paradigm. So fitting this, these, these steps into the new paradigm gets harder the closer you get to the field. So here, you know, you've got to do some sort of content modeling in order to understand, at least in a static world, how is the content going to be used? How effective is it going to be when I introduce these tools to capture the metadata? All I'm trying to do is capture metadata so my rules will fire, right? That's it. Because that's all I've got to work with, essentially. I've got a router, right? I can decide where to put the router. I can decide how to get the content to the routing mechanism. But the router is not going to fire the rule unless the metadata is there and correct. Right? That implies maybe something's going to help me figure out what that metadata is. It implies something's going to help me figure out what the right values are. It implies that I have some sort of process available to me in order to determine how to structure this stuff. Right? Good so far? Yep. Right? Am I on track? Yep. Okay. Once you've done that, you get this master list of content types. Right? And you're, you know, you've spent the money to figure out if you're confident that they're right. right? You've, done, you know, you've done user sessions to, to validate that, okay, yes, this is how I'm going to work with the content, and yes, I'm going to use it. Right? Now you've got to validate the data values. Right? It's one thing to set the columns on the content type. It's another thing to specify what the valid values are. Back to our example about the construction company which, a, which has a division in Atlanta, Georgia, right? But it's a global con construction firm, right? They've got divisions all over. And they've got one team that's managing all the records, okay? And that team is responsible for setting up a drop box. It's all they're responsible for today. And they're going to define those columns for one aspect of the business. The business is concerned with processing proposals from contractors who are going to deliver um, you know, actual proposals that someone in management is going to say yes or no. Okay? Yes, we're going to buy that service. No, we're not. Okay? So you're mapping on top of that a records management structure where you've got to say, well, when they say yes, then it's a record. Right? But only if the value of the contract is over a certain amount because we get so many proposals, we really don't want to keep Right? We don't want to apply retention unless it gets to a certain threshold. Simple rule, right? But it's focused on Atlanta, right? Okay? So you got a rule that says, okay, the amount has to be over $50,000, right? And it has to come within a certain time range, right? But it has to come from whatever the managed metadata store says this department geographical area is concerned with. So you've got to list in the term store the actual valid values. Right? You've got to then create a column that's associated with that particular term set so that your rule is guaranteed to fire. Right? Is that too much detail for you? Okay? But it's a real world scenario. Okay? So you've got to identify metadata that's essential to the firing of your rules and you've got to configure the SharePoint environment through the managed metadata service, means you've got to create those term sets, right? And you've got to specify the values and it has to be, you know, done in consistency with your rules, right? Okay. We can automate that. We can create an XML schema that allows us to suck those things in. We can create some sophisticated tools that allows us to, you know, simplify that process. But it is a configuration step, right? And it requires a good bit of work and, and forethought to make sure that it that it works properly. Okay. Step five, right? So we've got our content types, we've got our rules. Now we have to deal with retention because, right, retention in SharePoint, remember, is done through information policy. Right? There's no other way that we know of today to do retention using out of the box SharePoint. We have to create policies. Again, this is something we can automate, right? We can have a tool that allows us to specify the retention 
you know, that we want and have it spit out the XML that gets sucked into SharePoint so that it behaves properly. Um, you know, just as a side point, I think it's unnecessarily confusing because they're trying to put policy on content types when in fact every real world solution around records management uses the, the list. Right? It's, it's really better to do it location based and just use the content type to feed it right? rather than try to associate the policy with the type. That doesn't work so well in practice. It's great theory, but it, it, it breaks in a lot of scenarios. Why? Because you can only put one content type on a document at a time. Right? Does that make sense to you? Right? I mean, in the real world, we actually want more flexibility. If we're going to go to a type-based system, we need a more flexible one than what SharePoint offers. Right? Type-based systems uh, is, is theoretically pr preferable to a location-based one when you're dealing with collaborative content, but SharePoint imposes the restriction that you can only have one type at a time, which breaks most of the lifecycle models that we would, we would want to apply. Right? So we fall back to a location-based retention mechanism so that we can funnel content to the right location and have it take over. So what we have to do is we have to configure those. Right? We have to set up those retention policies, right? So um, determining whether the built-in SharePoint stages are sufficient for a given record type, typically they're not because SharePoint doesn't deal with event-based retention. It's a time-based retention mechanism, right? So we need something else. I mean, it's a platform, so we can create that, and several companies have done that, right? But, you know, retention means, you know, event-based retention where, you know, you know you know, this, keep this document until the project it's associated with ends, right? And then once that project ends, then apply your retention rule. Well, SharePoint doesn't have any built-in way to map the end of that project to this document, right? It's only driven off of a, of a date. So you need some other process that's going to look at the project, look at the document, say the project ends, find the document, update the date. Right. Once the date is updated, then SharePoint can calculate the expiration and fire the rule. Right. So there are companies that have fixed that problem, right. but there are third-party tools. One of them, Gimel. Right. Another of them, Collabware. I don't know if, are you familiar with this product, Collabware? This is one that I'm really excited about, and you'll, you'll find me I'm talking about it a little bit, because it, it takes a totally different approach than most of the tools that I've seen to date for doing records management in SharePoint. Um, they're a Vancouver-based company, um, uh, and you'll, you'll start hearing more uh, about it this year, I think. Okay, so um, again, as I said before, type-based policies are, are, are desirable from a theoretical standpoint, but location-based policies are the ones that work, right? Any questions so far? So, okay, okay, good, we're doing, we're doing pretty well, all right? How are we doing on time? A little after two? 20 minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes left? Okay. New paradigm. Key concepts of the new paradigm is that it's really more focused on the full content lifecycle. Okay? We want to take an approach that allows us to <coughs> model in a more natural way to the way people work with content. Content drives every business process, right? Content of some kind drives every business process. Consider the business process associated with managing records. What's the content? The retention rules, right? Okay, content types. All those things are content. It flows into the business process. It doesn't matter what the business process is. So, new paradigm. We have to do some content modeling in order to understand our content lifecycle. Right? You can't get around that. The problem for a practitioner in this space is convincing people to throw dollars at the modeling effort. Okay? Why? Because they see SharePoint. Can we just get our content in there? <laughs> right? Can you, can you just, we've got records management. Microsoft is telling me we've got records management. You've even got in-place records management. What's the problem? Right? Can't we just bring up the site first, move our content that we've got in SharePoint 2007 in today? Right? That's something I can throw dollars at. You're coming at me with this whole content modeling idea. It's so nebulous, I can't commit to that. Right? Okay? Content mapping flows out of the content modeling effort. Right? 
Why I do content modeling is because we've got to map the content to the business processes. So how do you con convey that as a value proposition? Right? Metadata capture, okay, we've got a content map. Now, how do we ensure that we're getting the right metadata? Because we've still got rules to apply, and that those rules are still a, a related to metadata, right? But now we're taking this new approach where we're modeling the content. You know, we're modeling the content actually by talking to the users, right? You cannot model content for a business process that you do not understand, right? Who understands those business processes? This is the people who are working with those processes every single day. You've got to talk to those people to figure out what content that they need, what content that they produce, and you've got to organize that in some fashion. And that's the only way you can really understand what's the projected impact of your rule. Right? Then you can define rules that have a high level of confidence you know, that you're actually mapping to the content the way that people are going to use it. And then finally, Google, search. Right? What are you going to put in front of people? Well, I'm on the shop floor. <coughs> I need to find the, um, you know, the 3D printing model that I'm going to use to apply to this 3D printing, printer because I'm making fabrication, I'm fabricating things in the field. Right? So I'm going to do a, a search. Maybe it's not a Google search, but I'm going to put in some keywords, and I want to find those files, right? And I say, build it, right? And you say, well, when you build this particular um, 3D printing model, right, you need to supply this metadata because this is important to the company, right, because of where you are, right? You happen to be in a zone where that device that you're about to build is highly regulated, right? And therefore, we need to know that when you built it, right, at that point, right, that's when the rule needs to fire. That's when the record needs to be declared, right? Multiply that by a thousand, right? You need the flexibility to layer transparent rule firing onto search. That's the reality of how people are really expecting these things to work. So, what does it look like? You've got to do some content modeling. That's going to feed your content migration effort. Right? The way these jobs, you know, these, these engagements are arising is out of a content migration requirement. We've got to get content from 2007 or the file share into our new SharePoint 2013 environment. Right? Right? We sat back while 2010 was you know, reaching critical mass, and now we're convinced SharePoint's going to be where we keep all our information. Okay, consultant, move our content from 2007 into 2013, right? But you better do it right, because 2013 is embracing the new paradigm, right? And we're going to have everything, you know, cloud-based, and we're going to enable search at every data point, right? So we've got to get to a content modeling effort that's tied to the content migration, and that's got to flow into a robust lifecycle management strategy. Otherwise, it's going to fail. For one or another reason, your, your, your engagement is going to um, depend on this process. So, what are you doing in modeling? You're identifying patterns based on some sort of methodology. You're identifying metadata, right, critical to that model and you're defining a strategy and building a loose term file plan here. Right? I didn't have a better way to define what this master model would look like, so I called it a file plan. Probably not a great choice of words, because right? it's well defined in most people's minds. Right? So I can change the file plan to content model. Right? You're producing a model. In practice, what I end up with is an XML file. Right? I created a schema, and the schema is driving the structure of that XML file. I use it with my tools. I've got custom tools that produce content types, you know, that whole scenario, right? Um, but then you've got to do the migration, and, and that's when you're doing the mapping. Now, there's some good tools out there that help you migrate and focus that migration on creating content types or mapping documents to types, but they're not that easy to use. I mean, it's not an easy process. Right. I can't imagine a tool 
that would actually be easy to use, unless you go to the point of saying, let the tool do it, right? Which I'm not really comfortable with, right? There are companies that are promising technology that's so smart, it can look at the document, read the document content, tag it, look at those tags, create the content type. Now, I've seen some pretty good algorithms, right? Concept Search has one, right? Very good. They have a pretty flexible mechanism. They can look at the actual content inside the document, come up with tags, and those tags are then mapped based on rules that you can define, and you can get pretty good suggestions about what kind of content that is. Right? And you can even surface that to the user and give them a list. Is it this, is it that? Right? And it's pretty effective, and, and the, the idea is that you can make it more um, you know, reliable over time. Um, to me, it suffers from, that whole concept suffers from the, the, the same problem that, you know, the old heuristic um, kind of uh, neural network type things suffered from, is that you've got to have a pretty controlled data source, otherwise your algorithm is not going to converge on, on a usable set, right? You throw bad data in there, you're going to get strange results. Um, but pretty, pretty effective, so that in conjunction with your methodology, could end up with creating a pretty um, concise set <coughs> of sites and repositories. Now, one point to mention here, these types don't have to map one-to-one. -one. <coughs> so back to this, the, that idea where, where I said, you know, I had identified 1,800 content types. Well, why was that? It's because I was driving it from the retention schedule, <coughs> right? If you're not driving it from, you know, a fixed retention schedule where each rule has to find some sort of unique mapping, right? you can reduce that because you're aggregating metadata. You don't have to call it the type that the metadata is, right? You can have just a document type. If it's got certain metadata, the rule's gonna fire on the metadata, it doesn't matter. You don't have to create a thousand content types. You can get by with 50, okay, right? Or you can get by with less if you have smarter rule processing, right? Or if you've got more tagging going on. More on that in a minute. Um, and then, your lifecycle management. Well, you've got a repository. Data's in the repository. It's either been classified or tagged, okay? You've got multiple processes that can look at that data and do different things at different times. Now you're starting to talk about workflows. You're starting to talk about, maybe even not workflows, just a queue of processes, right? Timer jobs that are gonna process that content look at the data, look at the metadata, and do something with it, right? And you, you then get to the point where you can say, well, not only can I process it for our records management purposes, I can use the exact same mechanism to process it for our standard business processing purposes, right? Or I can use the same mechanism to collect management evidence to reduce the risk exposure of the company, and I can do that later. I don't have to do that at the beginning. Right? I could do that anytime. I can hook a new process onto that same metadata and I can collect information about how the content is being used. Right? And that allows us to then adapt to changing requirements, changing rules, changing regulations. Right? The new paradigm is much more flexible in a lot of ways. Okay? So I didn't know what this is going to look like on the screen. Not good, huh? Map of the Atlantic Ocean, maybe? <laughs> this is an actual content model from my practice where I was hired to actually go in and analyze how people worked with content. So this is a little bit better, right? Can you see that? Can you see that in the back? I don't know. Right? Okay. And this is using a tool that, you know, it's a common tool. It's called MindJet, Mind Manager. You're familiar with it? Right? It's a great tool for a lot of reasons, right? It allows you to create structure and relationships in one nice, concise um, picture, right? So just to follow this, right, the process was, okay, let's get the right people in the room. So the first part of the engagement is to figure out who you need to talk to for a given department. So this was sort of nine departments in a construction firm where we, you know, divvied it up, and we actually brought the people to the room who were engaged in the business processes for that department or for some subset of that department, get the right people in the room, the ones who have the business process in their head, right? 
do a cross-section, people who are in management, people who are not in management, because their ideas about what they do are slightly different, right? And then, it, you know, one issue here is avoiding the shoulds and the shouldn'ts, you know, because you get people in the room and they say, I do this, and says, well, you're not supposed to be doing that, I'm supposed to be doing that, and, you know. So just, just a heads up, right, when you start doing this in practice, just, you have to be clear about what it is you're doing. I called it role, role activity modeling, but not role responsibility modeling, modeling because responsibility is a loaded term. You, know, you have to figure out how to say that properly in your environment. But basically what you're doing is you're identifying roles, associating them with responsibilities and activities within those responsibilities. Some, some of you who are familiar with some of the things that I've written about, um, it's really just four levels. Okay? Identify the role, figure out what those roles are responsible for, figure out what activities are needed to fulfill the responsibilities, and then figure out what content flows into the activity and what content flows out of the activity. That's it, right? Anybody can handle that. You don't have to be an analyst to be able to say, yes, I do this, no, I don't do that, right? There are basically two types who you'll encounter when you start doing this. One is the person who thinks conceptually, and the other one is the one who enumerates what they do. Nobody else, right? They're just going to fall into one of those camps. If they start enumerating what they, what they do, you're sitting there with mind manager and you're just capturing it, right? So, what do you do in a given day? Well, I do this, 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 and this, right? And then you just drill in. Well, when you do that, what else do you do? And you, you end up with a mind map that's just these things. I process new phone orders, and I review the phone usage, I process phone suspensions, and I process employee termination. That's what I do when I'm playing this role of phone right, manager or whatever, right, for, for requisitioning phones, right? You do that, and you get everybody to agree that this is, in fact, what I do, okay? And that may create some turmoil for a minute, but basically, you get them to agree, I did this whole process in three days, okay? You're just sitting with people, capturing what they do. Then you come back to them, and you present the map to the whole group. Everyone now sees what everybody else is responsible for and they're thinking along the lines of, you know, I'm telling you what my content requirements are. <laughs> I'm telling you what I do, right? You're going to come back to me, hopefully, with a system that maps to what I need to do. It's not perceived. When you introduce SharePoint, it's not perceived as an increase in my work. It's, it's perceived as something that's going to add value to my day. But then you come back and you map on top of that, you just ask the simple question. Okay, you've told me that you review phone usage. What do you need in order to do that? What content do you need? And they'll tell you, well, I get it from the phone usage database. It's not in SharePoint, it's out here. We've got an Oracle database that keeps track of all the phone usage. Well, that creates a dependency, right? And then you just map the dependencies. You just say, where does the content flow in? Where does it flow out? And you end up with this map, right? You can even drill it in. You can say, well, you know, I'm hearing that you, when you update accounting with phone information, what information do you need? Well, I really only need the business unit and the job number. Right? You tack that in. This is all using out-of-the-box mind manager stuff. Right? And you end up with this nice map. You have to follow a certain convention. Right? That's the only drawback with using mind manager, because it's not designed to do content modeling. But you end up with something that is useful from two respects. Right? You end up with something that allows you to um, unambiguously communicate content dependencies to anyone in the organization. Right? You can sit them down and say, look, this is what you guys told me. And this is what we're going to try to implement. Right? Yes or no? And they'll say, yes, this is it. Do it. Okay? The second thing you end up with is you have an XML structure. <laughs> right? The thing about mind managers, you can build a plugin, which I did. You build a plugin and it'll just read this and spit it out into one large XML file. Right? You've got to follow some rules so that you can adhere to whatever schema you've defined, but you've got roles, responsibilities, activities, and content in an XML model. That could form the basis of any tool that you might want to spit out of that. You can process that to produce workflows. You can process that to tell you which workflows are needed for certain content. It can tell you which content is dependent on other content. It can tell you all kinds of information just from this model. Okay, Let's take that one step further.
further, right? Keep this in mind. <laughs> F of garbage equals garbage, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter. You, you can have a great model. If you put garbage data in there, you're going to get garbage data out, right? You can have perfectly structured data. If you have no model or garbage model, you're going to get garbage results, right? Garbage in, garbage out, right? We know this, okay? So it's not enough to just define the model. You've got to look at the data, too. You've got to make sure that that data maps in. Why? Because we're ending up with metadata. So don't be afraid. This is just a Visio file, right? Okay? This is a process that actually works pretty well, right? You've got stages, that role activity modeling, use case modeling, Findability analysis. This is where I'm going to focus some attention. Put ability analysis, right? This is where it gets messy, and if you don't have a model, you miss this, right? You've got to make sure that you've identified critical metadata, and you've got to come up with keyword queries that map to that, or the users are not going to be able to find what they need. You've also got to have some put ability analysis because you're not going to get away from the need for repositories. You've got to know where the data needs to go, right? That independent of whether you're declaring them as records in the process, right? The data is going to come from somewhere, it's going to go somewhere. File plan development is sort of a spin-off of this. This whole thing is a life cycle analysis. This is where you're starting to really get into enumerating those key data fields, defining search scopes, and here you can identify security constraints to map in your access controls and things like that. And then over here you've got the standard sort of um, repository and, you know, setting up your repository in SharePoint. This is another column that I added here, this dependency structure matrix. I'm really interested, just from a personal perspective, in managing and, and analyzing dependencies between content to help tune this process, but that, you could eliminate that column um, as you're thinking about, you know, implementing your own thing. So let me just drill into this new paradigm, right? Big deal here. Who's producing content? Who's consuming content, right? From that model, not only you can tell information about your content, you can, from that very same structure, find out information about the consumption, the consumers and the producers of content as well. You can figure out which producers are dependent on which consumers, right? And vice versa, right? Where the content flows from and to. That's information that you can also use. One way to use that is, for example, if you do an analysis and you find that there's one group, you know, it, there's nothing magical about structuring an organization, right? You, organizations are dynamic, they evolve, and so you might find that there are bottlenecks that nobody really knew about. And you do this content analysis and you find out that all of a sudden there's this one group that, by virtue of the fact that they're really good at what they do, they have become a bottleneck for content because now all these consumers and all these different business units are dependent on that group, right? That could influence how you decide to introduce any kind of content management solution, right? Records management especially. When that happens, right, and you start to see clustering around a particular set of producers, right, then you've got to make a choice. Well, how big is the impact going to be? What is there? Am I introducing more risk by creating a solution for them when in fact they already know how to process that information. Maybe I need to go back to them and figure out what's working for them and incorporate that into my plan, right? Because, you know, I could structure it based on the way that the industry says I should structure that information or I could structure it based on the way this particular company is effectively using that information which then would lead to better user adoption and better success even though it's a deviation from the norm. Right? Okay? So the content model can be useful in a lot of different ways, right? But <clears throat> you're going to do a mapping of content to producers that is different from the mapping to consumers. And what's interesting about the mapping to consumers is that when you start looking at the business process activities that those consumers are involved in, you can, even from that, you can define um, workspaces for them in SharePoint. You can say, okay, this particular group needs a web part page which, which aggregates content from external data sources, internal data sources specific to that business process, right? And 
you can put action items on those custom web parts. These, these are all basically just um, custom content uh, search core results web parts, right? Who knows what I'm talking about? Right? You know, you know. One th great thing about the way that SharePoint is architected is, is you've got these search web parts that you can now customize to add actions to them, right? So you can just derive from the, in, from the core results web part, put it on a web part page, and give people buttons to perform actions that they understand, right? So you can create, by looking at the content that's mapped to the consumption, right, that's required for a particular set of activities, you can easily define web part pages that have the right search results. These are search pages, right? Not just web part pages. These are custom search pages. So they're, you're putting in front of them a page. They can do whatever search they want, but the core results have actions that they recognize, and they can perform those actions just by clicking the button on the search results, right? Search results is like a grid. You, it comes down. You can add a little checkbox to them, right? I'm searching for my 3D printing um, models. I want to do something with these three. And if the button is there that says, um, send for approval, right? And when you click that button, it goes to a content organizer. It goes to a drop box, a drop off library with a content organizer rule that sends an alert to another group that's determining whether those are relevant for this particular group, right? You've got a lot of flexibility. You're driving it from the front end with search page, and you're driving it from the back end with a content organizer that's been repurposed as a poor man's workflow, right? And it's then sending the content to the right place so they can make the right decision. How do you know what right place is? Content model, right? So it all sort of comes back to modeling. How do you get the metadata? How do you figure out where it goes, right? <coughs> so that's the next step. Figure out who owns the content, <coughs> right? So you've got content producers, content consumers, but in, in built into that is who owns that content? Who's the primary owner of that content? Who has the knowledge required to manage that content, okay? And then based on that, figure out what the security profile needs to be, all your other mechanisms sort of flow out of that. There you're going to see that there are conflicts because there are overlaps, right? Certain groups need the content at certain times. Another group needs that same content at a different time to do different things. We we'll run out of time. It's over? Okay. Um, and then identify critical metadata. Step three here is now focus on search with all the stuff that comes out of that. Focus a little bit on your um, storage mechanisms. Maybe there's some additional constraints that come from that, right? And then finally, retention. Interestingly now, retention's at the end, <laughs> right? It's flipped the paradigm completely, OK? Just leave you with this idea. <laughs> this is kind of where we are in the industry, OK? The cloud, right? Silver bullet, silver lining, right? I think it's a silver lining, <laughs> OK? Because I don't believe in silver bullets, OK? Um, thank you for coming. I'm going to skip the last through, but you're going to have the slides available. These are sort of the pipelining idea, a couple of additional ideas, but um, that's basically all I have. <laughs>